Hey, this is Ari. Welcome back to the Energy Blueprint Podcast. With me today is Dr. Vincent Pedre, who is the medical director of Pedre Integrative Health and founder of Dr. Pedre Wellness, nutraceutical consultant and spokesperson for Nature MD, CEO of Happy Gut Life LLC, and a functional medicine certified practitioner with a concierge practice in New York City since 2004. He believes the gut is the gateway to excellent wellness. As the best-selling author of Happy Gut, the cleansing program to help you lose weight, gain energy, and eliminate pain, featuring his proprietary blueprint for healing the gut, the Gut Care Program, he has helped thousands around the world resolve their gut health issues. Uh, on a personal note, I will say that I really enjoyed connecting with Dr. Pedra and getting his insight into a number of controversial gut health-related issues, and I found this conversation really fun and insightful. So I hope you will enjoy it and get a lot of value from it. So Dr. Pedre, thank you so much for coming on the show. It's a pleasure to have you. Hey man, I've been following you for quite a while on Facebook, love your posts. So I'm really excited to be here. Thank you for having me on. Thank you so much, my friend. The, the feeling's very mutual. I've been meaning to have you on for a long time since your book came out. Uh, what, two years ago, something like that? Oh no, it's been, <laughs> it's, been it's crazy. No, um, six plus years ago. What? Oh my gosh, time flies. Yeah. That is crazy. Six okay. years ago. <laughs> and, you, and, and you have another book coming out soon, right? Next year. Next year. And what's yeah. the title of that one? I know I was just, ju I commented on the cover designs for it. Yeah, thank you. Um, the Gut Smart Protocol. The Gut Smart Protocol, I like it. Okay, so yeah. given that it's the Gut Smart Protocol, uh, you're known as America's gut doctor. How did, how did you get there? How did you develop an interest in gut health and end up specializing it and become America's gut doctor? Yeah, interestingly, I was one of those kids that was put on like 20 plus rounds of antibiotics by their pediatrician over the course of my teenage years. And I always suffered from gut issues. Uh, but being on that many antibiotics, you can just calculate it was probably two to three rounds of antibiotics per year that destroyed my gut microbiome, led to leaky gut. I developed sensitivities to gluten and dairy specifically, but some other foods. And even if I look back at my pictures, so I always had weight issues, usually being too underweight, which was probably my leaky gut. But then in college, when I went away and I was eating in the dining halls and eating a lot of bread and wheat, like you could see my face was puffy. Like I was just retaining water. And it took me, honestly, it took me several decades to really figure it out. And it was having, um, you know, more systemic effects on me, especially gluten was causing mental fog making me feel really tired, not being able to get through a 12 hour work day. And back then I was seeing patients like 12 hours a day or my day started and ended like in 12 hour. And I was looking to biohack and see how can I make myself better because I can't get through the work day without wishing that I could take a nap at 3 PM. Mm -hmm. And I started looking into the gut when I discovered functional medicine and I realized like, wait, oh shit. Like I was on 20 plus rounds of antibiotics. Mm -hmm. My gut microbiome is destroyed and I've never done anything to restore it. So I became my patient number one, thinking that I was just basically doomed to IBS for the rest of my life. And then all of those other symptoms, the brain fog, all that, the, the achy joints, skin rashes. And I was able to reverse these things, with probiotics, prebiotics, you know, um, shifted a, our diet, started eating organic, like really getting into where food was being sourced. And I just became fascinated with it because in our medical training, you basically for any gut diagnosis, there's only about three different medications that you can give. You know, you give an antispasmodic, you give an antiacid, or you give an antidepressant. And I thought to myself, this is wrong. Like, this has to be more complicated than what we've been taught. Like, how can it be this simple that all these people who have kind of similar 
symptoms, but they're slightly different. And so the gut patients always were super confusing to me, but I love figuring out puzzles. So when I got into functional medicine, I was like, wow, these gut patients, actually what I thought was just two shades of gray is multiple shades of grays and different colors. And there's actually more stuff going on underneath the surface than I ever thought because we couldn't test for it because we don't know what to test for. And when you send a stool test to Quest or LabCorp for OVA and Parasite, 99.99% of the time you get a negative. And that gives you no information, right? And I mean, over the years I've seen, you know, so I got really fascinated because of myself and, and then working with gut patients and seeing them get better and realizing, wow, this is, this is kind of fun. I wasn't even trying to be a gut expert. I'm like, this is just kind of fun. Mm -hmm. I like working with people's guts. It's, it's happy. It's easy. You change people's diets, you fix their microbiome. And suddenly they come in and they tell you their asthma has disappeared or that this is the first year they don't have spring allergies. And you're like, what? Like all of this because of the gut. I mean, you, I learned it in theory, but when you start seeing it in practice, then it's, it's really remarkable. So it got me deeper and deeper into the gut. And, and I just kept getting referrals, like patients referred their friends, their family, and it was endless. And I thought, why are these people, they don't know the solution. It's just so simple, <laughs> like mm -hmm. change your diet, fix your microbiome, you know, heal your leaky gut, and then you're good. And life is good. Obviously it's not that simple, but I, I thought, you know, I want to write a book about this. And I had wanted to write a book for six years, but it was, it, it really wasn't about just writing, you know, just being a scientist, writing a book about anything. I wanted to write a book that was authentic and real for me. And this was the topic. This was it. And I was very lucky that I, I kind of was at the very beginning of the wave with the microbiome when my book came out and I knew that I wanted to have a voice. I wanted to help as many people as possible, but I wasn't going to do that trying to be the doctor of everything. The best way for me to do that was to be the doctor of the one thing that niche that I love, that spoke to me, that was the way that I could communicate with people and that became the gut. Beautiful. Okay, I have a, a long list of questions for you. Um, I, I actually, I'm, I'm very up to date on my, my gut health related knowledge. I just took a course with uh, one of the world's leading researchers in, in gut health and I learned a ton and I, I had to take a test and, so I'm, I'm well studied on all these topics. So um, I'm also very interested in the fact that some of the other gut health inter, uh, experts that I've interviewed have differing opinions from one another. So I'm curious to get your take on some of these more controversial topics. Um, yeah. Okay, so first of all, as an entry point, let's talk about the connection of gut health to some of those symptoms that you were talking about, particularly energy. Uh, and you mentioned that you personally were falling asleep at, you know, 3 p.m. in the afternoon, um, yeah. brain fog, obviously GI symptoms, but some of these more systemic system, uh, symptoms related to mood and energy and things yeah. of that nature. What's going on mechanistically that links the gut with those symptoms? So, you know, I'll go from, from macro, which is... Uh, the bigger picture, uh, anybody who's got gut issues, anybody who's been on antibiotics, anybody who's stressed, anybody who's taking over-the-counter ibuprofen, women on birth control pill, they're all going to have leaky gut or certain, certain um, you know, they'll be on the spectrum of gut leakiness. And when you've got leaky gut, um, they've actually shown in studies that bacteria and bacterial DNA gets into your bloodstream. And when that gets into your bloodstream, especially when you're exposed to certain bacterial um, proteins and lipopolysaccharides, so the biggest one being endotoxin, that activates your immune system. And it's almost like having a mild flu. 
If you don't feel sick, you're not sick enough to feel like you've got a cold, but you're activating the immune system enough that it's going to cause your brain to kind of shut down. And when your gut becomes leaky, then your blood brain barrier becomes leaky. So that protective um, circulation, the brain is not there. Mm -hmm. So things can get through lipopolysaccharide is fat soluble. So it can get through that blood brain barrier anyway. And they're binding receptors in the hypothalamus for endotoxin. Mm -hmm. And it activates a very specific pathway. It's called the, the NF kappa B pathway. So it's an inflammatory cascade. So it causes inflammation in the brain and that leads to brain fog. Now for me, so on those days, specifically the worst days for me were when I went and had a sandwich or I went and had a slice of pizza as my lunch. And a couple of hours later, I could barely keep my eyes open. Well, we know that gluten metabolizes into a whole series of metabolites. And some of them actually become morphine-like substances called gluteomorphins. There's also glutenins and those are neurotoxic. So they're having um, an effect on your brain as well. It's making you feel like you've got to go to sleep. So from the perspective of leaky gut and also the metabolites coming from these either gluten, dairy also, you get caseomorphins as well. So morphine-like chemicals from dairy that just basically dumb down your brain. They make you feel like it's shutting down. Mm -hmm. Got it. Let, let's, since you brought up gluten and dairy, let's go deeper into, into gluten, especially. So are you making the, this is one of those controversial topics that there's a pretty wide variety of opinions among experts. Um, are you of the opinion that everyone universally should avoid gluten or how would you sort of distinguish between, you know, like overt celiac disease versus gluten intolerance versus non-celiac gluten sensitivity? Uh, do you think any yeah. of those distinctions matter or if gluten is just bad? Everybody should get rid of gluten. <laughs> That's a really great question. Uh, and I know a very controversial question. Um, you know, you, you distinguish it first by the testing, you know, so celiac, you can check genetics, HLA, DQ2, DQ8. And you can also distinguish it by looking at antibodies to tissue transglutaminase, right? Um, and it's, there's a very specific definition for celiac. Of course, the gold standard is endoscopy that shows the, the blunting of the villi. So you see that the gut barrier has been compromised. Non-celiac gluten sensitivity is a bit more controversial. There's not a perfect test for it. So you can look at deaminated gliadin peptide and see if there are IgG antibodies to that. And that might be, or IgA or IgG antibodies. And that might be a sign that the person is gluten sensitive. And that's where I fell. So what, what took for me to give up gluten, because I was like, this is a really big <laughs> sacrifice, even though I was starting to tell my patients to go gluten-free, I was like, how in the world am I going to do this? So I needed blood test verification. And I tested positive via food sensitivity test. Um, it was an IgG with complement activation and gluten lit up really high for me. And really in the end, the gold standard, I think, because there, there's no perfect test, especially when it comes to these IgG food sensitivities. There's no standardization. So you could send the bl same blood sample to the same lab and get slightly different results. Mm -hmm. Whereas if you're doing IgE testing, which most people know like peanut allergy, pine nut allergies, those are standardized across every single lab. So if you send it to one lab, you're gonna get the same result as another lab. So, you know, what I tell people is when you're looking at, especially when you're getting into the sensitivity category, this is a Monet painting. It's kind of blurry. You might know you're looking at Big Ben, but you can't see it in full detail. And same thing, this is giving you kind of a ballpark uh, assessment of where you're at. The, the interesting study that I saw was a study that looked at the effect on gut permeability of gluten on different types of people. So they had a normal group, a non-celiac gluten sensitive group, and a celiac disease group. 
And what they found was that as expected in the celiac disease group, gluten increased gut permeability the most. In the non-celiac gluten sensitive group, it increased um, gut permeability, but not as much as in the, the celiac group. What was surprising is that in the normal group, it also increased gut permeability, not as much as the non-celiac, not as much as the, the celiac. So it was like celiac was worse, non-celiac second worse, and normal was not zero. Mm -hmm. There was somewhere in between. So the question then becomes, I think, a bigger macro question of how wheat has been hybridized and transformed and whether our genetics have evolved <laughs> fast enough to deal with the change in the gluten concentration in this hybridized dwarf wheat mm -hmm. compared to some of the more ancient wheat. Mm -hmm. And, you know, so when you say, you know, am I a proponent for everybody to be gluten free? Usually, you know, I start with what are your symptoms? What are you experiencing? You know, if you feel great and you're, you're having wheat from time to time and it's not causing any brain fog, any sinus issues, any immune issues, nothing, nothing that you're feeling, no joint inflammation, no joint aches, which are the types of symptoms you might see with someone who's gluten sensitive then, you know, your gut is probably fine mm -hmm. and you don't need to make a change. But if you are experiencing these things, you can go the route of, of doing testing or you can go on a gluten-free diet and test it out yourself and see the before and after. Because I really do think that, you know, that experiential test of seeing how your body reacts to not being on gluten, I think is really important. And what I've noticed and what I've seen with patients is when you are gluten sensitive, within two to three weeks, you feel a shift. Mm -hmm. The biggest shift I felt was suddenly I didn't need a, need a nap at 3 p.m. Mm -hmm. My energy level shot up. I could get through a 12 hour day and still be as mentally sharp at the end of the day as I was at the beginning of the day. So I knew that gluten had taking gluten out had made a difference. Mm -hmm. And the, the interesting thing is, you know, they say that it takes six to 12 months to, to basically metabolize all the gluten metabolites that are actually still in your system. And when I did this back in 2007, I kept testing. I tested at the three month mark and I got some weird itchy rash on the inside of my wrist. I tested again at six month mark, same thing happened. I tested again at the year mark, same thing happened. But during that time, the longer I was off of gluten, the better I felt. Mm -hmm. And I think that's something that um, a lot of people may miss when they do an elimination of whether it's gluten, dairy, that you might get to a certain level at four weeks but you're not going to feel the full benefits until probably a couple of months in mm -hmm. as the inflammation in your body starts to resolve. So, you know, I'm, I'm a big believer in self-observation and intuitive eating. And really one of the things that I, I teach my, my patients is to listen to their bodies, you know, and be your own doctor, like be your own health guru because you're the one who knows your body better than anybody else. Mm -hmm. Well said, I like that answer, very nuanced. Okay, so um, do you think it's worth going into to dairy as well? Uh, do, you, do you recommend dairy avoidance pretty much across the board? And do you feel it's just, it's universally damaging to gut health or, or not so much? That is, a, that is a very nuanced answer, so you know, as part of my program in happy gut, I take dairy out. Mm -hmm. And that's because, you know, for people who have gut issues, anywhere between 70, 90% of people across the world have lactose intolerance. Part of that is probably due to dysbiosis. So derangements, imbalances in their gut microbiome. So they can't digest lactose as well. Now, the caveats to that are also like, 
knowing food sourcing, you know, because when we're talking about dairy, you know, are we talking about factory dairy or organic dairy? Are we talking about pasture raised dairy that, you know, so it's not the same thing. You can't compare them. Uh, butter that comes from factory raised cows is probably one of the most toxic things you could eat. But butter from pasture raised cows can be great for you, you know, or ghee, which is devoid of the dairy protein. So if you, if you absolutely have issues with dairy proteins, food sensitivities, because a lot of people get confused. Lactose intolerance is not a sensitivity to dairy. They're not the same thing. One is an enzyme deficiency. So you can't break down the sugar and you get a lot of gas bloating and maybe diarrhea. And the other one leads to systemic effects because you're getting an IgG response. You're getting the um, blood antibody response to the dairy proteins, whether it's casein or whey. It gets more complicated than this because the, the, the majority of the cows in the US are what we call A1 cows. And it has to do where the, there's a one amino acid mutation on that casein protein that makes it very difficult for our enzymes to cleave the protein. But if you go to New Zealand, the majority of the cows are A2 cows. And that one or two, all it means is that there is a difference in one amino acid. That one amino acid difference means that A2 milk is much easier to cleave that casein protein into smaller amino acid chains that do not cause an immune reaction, whereas A1 milk does. So, you know, there's so many levels and we can get to raw versus Mm non-raw milk. And I'm a big fan of raw cheeses because it's still full of all the enzymes. And I think that as part of a program of rebuilding the gut, even though you might take dairy out, eventually there, there is a role for introducing fermented dairy in the form of kefir, maybe homemade kefir from organic milk or maybe organic goat milk, uh, less antigenic than dairy and or yogurt you know so i think being black or black and white about this is wrong because there's a lot of nuances depending on the person Um, i'll give you an example again from my own experience Uh, i went to guatemala in january of 2021 got giardia (laughs) probably from being in lake atiflan and could be worse you could have been in lake titicaca (laughs) (laughs) which is obviously the best name for a lake ever created yes right (laughs) sorry i digress (laughs) and um you know while i was treating myself for it i i actually avoid dairy in the winter months because it creates more mucus and it'll make it easier for me to get sick but for some reason intuitively my body was asking for kefir and as I was healing my gut from the, the Giardia with bone broth, probiotics, you know, all the things that I know to do, I started having a shot of kefir every day. And that made a huge difference. Interesting. I, you know, I had dairy as a big part of my diet for many, many years. And um, both consuming, you know, yogurt and raw, I was generally consuming good quality raw milk. and um, uh, and lots of whey protein, tons of whey protein supplements and even casein protein supplements. And then at, at a certain point, I started to develop this weird symptom that took me months to figure out what was causing it. It felt like, you know, that, that feeling you have on the first day you're catching a cold where you have this kind of irritation in the back of the throat, something in your nose yeah, yeah. and a little congestion. I felt like that every day for months. And that's, I thought, like, that's maybe, a- do I have a, a chronic sinus infection or something? And that's a typical symptom of dairy sensitivity. Yeah. So I, and then I removed dairy and it went away within a couple of days. And after that point, I, I thought, oh, I guess my body's reactive to dairy now. And so I removed dairy from my diet completely for like two or three years. And I just recently reintroduced it without any symptoms. I I'm curious if you know, sort of the mechanisms behind what could explain that? Because I certainly don't. One can be overexposure. 
Mm -hmm. So when it comes to food sensitivities, there's threshold issues. So it could be that you passed your threshold that then activated your immune system. There could have been other shifts going on in your gut microbiome at the time. Maybe your gut permeability was a little bit higher and then it was just kind of smoldering the fire. You mm -hmm. kept exposing yourself to, to whey, which is also can be kind of hard for the digestive system to break down. Mm. You know, again, without all those enzymes, you know, because raw milk has all the enzymes. Um, but the other thing I wanted to mention is um, a really, I think, really important study that came out last year, Stanford University, where they looked at a, a group of mostly women. Now, it's not, I, I will paraphrase by saying this was not a large study, and it certainly wasn't a diverse group. It was mostly white women. It was divided into 18 and 18. 18 people did a high fermented foods diet and 18 people did a high fiber rich diet. Mm. And they wanted to look at different parameters. They looked at 19 different inflammatory markers. They looked at the, um, the immune system, how the immune system was behaving. And they also looked at microbial diversity. And I don't know if you saw this study, but I'm going to mm. ask you, which group do you think was able to attain the greatest gut microbiome diversity, the high fiber rich, the fiber rich diet group or the high fermented foods group? Maybe I'd go with fiber if it had a diversity of fiber. That's what I would have said. Mm -hmm. And the surprising result was, and that's what they teach in functional medicine. They're like, eat the rainbow, eat a bunch of fiber. Like that creates diversity in the gut microbiome. And yet it was the fermented foods group that it, was able to reach the highest diversity. Interesting. Yeah. Well, I, I, with some and fermented foods, there's quite a, an amazing diversity of microorganisms in there. But it is, but it, you can't think of it as just like, you know, the reason that I was thinking that fiber was better is because fiber is a prebiotic and it's going right. to feed exactly. a wide variety. Mm -hmm. um, but what I realized is that our thinking of fermented foods is a little bit limited. Mm -hmm. Because we're thinking like you're eating, um, you know, if you're drinking uh, kefir, you're getting a lactobacillus, whatever it is. And, and that's what you're adding to your gut. Yeah. No, you're adding, you're seeding a bacteria that's going to create postbiotic metabolites that then feeds other groups of bacteria. And it's going to support the growth of uh, this whole complex group of bacteria. So it's actually increasing microbial diversity. Mm -hmm. And the other thing that it, that the fermented foods diet did was lower 19 markers of inflammation. Nice. Whereas the, the fiber rich diet, what it did was it helped with immunomodulation mm -hmm. and it benefited people who were healthier more than people who started with an unhealthy diet. Very, very interesting. Okay. Um, let's get into, let's, zoom out for a second. So you've mentioned um, gut permeability, leaky gut several times thus far. What's, what's the sort of the big picture list of factors that are causing this? Why do so many people have leaky gut now? I, I assume a hundred years ago, this wasn't the case. We didn't have an epidemic of leaky gut. What's going on in the modern world? And I think you have some personal experience with one of those factors that's contributing to it. I think one of the biggest factors, antibiotics. Mm -hmm. And either, you know, there was a study that, that came out recently that looked at antibiotic prescribing. And it was interesting because they were looking at um, different ethnic groups and they found that in the black community and Hispanic community, antibiotics tended to be prescribed more, were more likely to be prescribed mm -hmm. from a doctor's appointment than other groups or white Caucasians, but overall antibiotics are overprescribed. But if you look at the rest of the world, you can just walk up to the pharmacy and get an antibiotic without a doctor's prescription. Yeah. So outside of the U S I think we can also say that antibiotics are being overused and oversimplified because people can just have a cold and say, I'm going to go get an antibiotic to knock this out. You know, two, two weeks ago, um, our nanny had in, in Costa Rica had a, uh, like a boil on her butt on the back of her leg, you know, like a, 
the best way I can describe is like a big blister. Yeah, it's like a it's like a bliss. It's like an infected blister underneath the skin. Her she went to the doctor and they prescribed systemic oral antibiotics for it for a single blister on the back of her leg. And the doctor said she told me the doctor said something like, uh, "If I don't give you the antibiotics, you're going to have this all over your body in two weeks." And I was like, "That sounds like total BS to me." Like, why would you not do, maybe, maybe you could justify a local antibiotic ointment or injection or something, but to give somebody oral antibiotics for a blister on the back of their leg is insane. And, um, and in the time that I've known her, she's been prescribed three courses of antibiotics for random little issues like that. She goes to the doctor and they, oh, antibiotics for this, antibiotics for that. I'm like, I, I cannot believe I was, how common look, it is. Look, I'm a medical doctor. I was trained in this country. I know how they think yeah. because I was trained to think that way mm -hmm. at one point. And I had to rewire the way that I thought about things because you start realizing we're just, we're using too many antibiotics. Yeah. You know, I just got reminded of a study. I must've seen this 10 or 15 years ago and I won't remember the specifics, but it, it was talking about the incidence of doctors prescribing antibiotics for viral respiratory infections knowingly like not not when they don't when they don't even they're not even concerned that it's a bacterial infection but prescribing it basically knowingly as a placebo because they know that patients will walk out of the doctor's office more content feeling more satisfied with that doctor's visit if they were prescribed something that they now at least have the placebo effect from um, versus if I, the doctor said, well, it's a viral infection. We don't have anything to treat the viral infection. So just go home and rest and eat chicken soup and, you know, drink. Having, having been there, can I, can I just insert a bit of a dystopian tone to this? <laughs> yes, please. <laughs> As a doctor within the insurance based medical system, you have 15 minutes to see a patient and get them out of that room. So you want to do whatever is not just going to make them happy. It's going to move them out. Mm -hmm. And I was that doctor at one point that within, and they've looked at this, they've done studies within the first minute, first minute of a visit, patients telling you what they're there for. The doctor is already thinking, what medication can I prescribe to this patient wow. to get them out the door? Yeah. And I ran into problems because I was the patient. I was I, not the patient, the doctor that butted heads with patients telling them you have a viral infection. I'm not going to prescribe an antibiotic. Mm. It takes a little more time because now I need to educate the person on you've got a viral infection. These are the things we can do. This is what you can do to optimize your immune system so your body can fight this off better. Now, the, the caveat is something interesting that I discovered, and I know we're not talking, I know we're in gut health, but I'm just, we're just on this tangent. Um, I discovered during COVID, because I was researching why Zithromax might mm -hmm. be beneficial. Uh -huh. And I found a study that showed that Zithromax turned on antiviral genes in the lung cells that produce interferon. Uh -huh. So that's interesting because that's the one antibiotic, antibacterial that I've read actually has some antiviral properties mm -hmm. that I didn't realize. So, you know, just digging through the research, I found that. But by and far, you know, like, when I was working, I was working for one of the busiest practices in the Upper East Side and already my philosophy was changing. Like, I'm not gonna, I couldn't with good conscience give an antibiotic. And this is before I really understood the full depth of everything that it causes in the gut and the, you know, the, the downstream problems. And I refused to give an antibiotic to a patient. She walked out, checked back in, got in to see a PA in the same practice that so she knew would just give her the antibiotic and wow. got her antibiotic and left happy. Oh my gosh, that's nuts. And then she, of course she, she gave me a really bad review. <laughs> For not giving her antibiotics. For not giving her the antibiotic. You know, yeah. I, I think it's worth 
stating this directly, we're kind of both implied it, but just consider given what you've said about antibiotics and gut health. Now, what kind of collateral damage is being done from just that one practice of prescribing Simple. antibiotics Simple. in this, I mean, in this inappropriate they, context that's happening, what, hundreds of thousands of times every day in, in doctor's offices? Cipro. So one course of Cipro, the most commonly prescribed antibiotic for UTIs, five-day course, will cause a derangement in the gut microbiome, so an imbalance that without any other correction will take 12 months to recover. Wow. And when you do repeated courses of antibiotics, the belief is that over time, say like, like you're, you're growing up, you're a toddler, you're being exposed to breast milk, you're, you're, your gut microbiome is getting expanded and educated. So by the age of six, it's almost become like the adult gut microbiome. Say the diversity is here. Every time you have an antibiotic course, as you recover, you never hit the same diversity. It keeps dropping. Mm -hmm. You can never get back to where you were supposed to be. Mm -hmm. Five-day course of Zithromax, the most commonly prescribed antibiotic for you know, upper respiratory infections. Six months to recover. Oof. Now, the scary thing is that I was at the Microbiome Congress I don't know, I think it was 2018, 2019, heard a lecture from a researcher that was looking at what happens to the gut microbiome of people who live together when one of them is prescribed an antibiotic. Oh, interesting. And I think they were looking at Zithromax, so the Z-Pack, and, and, they, and they did different, different groups. So they did husband, wife, they did roommates that were not romantically involved. And the scary thing was that if one took the antibiotic, the other one who wasn't taking the antibiotic showed a change, a shift in their gut microbiome. Wow. And it wasn't dependent on whether they were sleeping together, you know, exchanging fluids or not. It happened across the board. Crazy. Yeah, I don't, I think that was, I, I don't know if that has been published. I know that was research that was being presented and they were, you know, just sharing that. But I thought, wow, that's, that's a whole other level that I'm not even ready yeah. <laughs> to deal with because yeah. you're prescribing to, you know, you, you're a father, you've got a wife. Like imagine now to think like if you take it, you're affecting your whole family. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. It's wild. Or if my nanny takes it, how is she affecting my kids? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I mean, for something like that, I think that I, mm -hmm. I would want to see the research and, you know, just verify that it's true. But yeah. the, the big picture is antibiotics cause a loss in microbial diversity. If you lose microbial diversity, that causes an increase in gut permeability. Add to that the standard American diet, the lack of fiber in the diet. I still think, even though I just presented this whole juxtaposition between fiber rich and fermented foods, I'm not saying don't eat fiber and just eat fermented foods. That could be really bad for some people. Fiber is still good. We need fiber. And fiber is in some ferment. I mean, I don't know if in, it was in that particular study, but let's say you eat sauerkraut or kimchi or something like that. You're getting plenty of fiber. Right. You are getting some fiber there. And the thing is that the average American only gets 10 to 15 grams of fiber a day. And we're supposed to be getting anywhere between 25 and 35 grams of fiber, mm -hmm. even just for what it does to the gut microbiome and the immune system, you know? Mm -hmm. So that in itself, you know, antibiotics, poor diet, add stress, catecholamines. Catecholamines are like an attack on the gut. They increase gut permeability. High cortisol causes... Um, changes in the gut microbiome, eating too much sugar, artificial sweeteners, all these things change, cause shifts in the gut microbiome. And whenever you cause a shift, we're, our gut barrier is dependent on a healthy gut microbiome. So it's not just on our side, it's on the other side as well. And maintaining that mucus layer. So all these things lead to increases in intestinal permeability. I mentioned ibuprofen, uh, birth control pill, 
So there's a lot of different medications that can increase gut permeability as well. Even acetaminophen can, um, they showed in a study that it will lead to imbalances in the gut microbiome and anything that even if indirect, if direct, it's not directly increasing gut permeability, indirectly it will if it's causing a shift in the gut microbiome to something that's not as favorable. Mm -hmm. um, I think an, an, an important thing to mention is all of the, all of the symptoms that leaky gut can lead to that aren't just localized to your gut. Mm -hmm. Because leaky gut is the common denominator that connects a lot of chronic health issues. Mm -hmm. So leaky gut is behind allergies, asthma, airway issues, headaches, migraines specifically, um, any sort of skin rashes, hives, any other systemic conditions can be tied to the gut. Joint inflammation, even things that we call autoimmune disease because we can measure autoimmune markers for it in the blood could still be tied to leaky gut and to dysbiosis imbalance in the gut microbiome and maybe yeast overgrowth, things like that. Excellent. Okay. So I have a, pro a probiotic question and a prebiotic question for you. So probiotics, um, I interviewed two gut health experts uh, recently. I won't mention names, but I guess people will find out if they listen to my podcast because I'll release both of them. Um, one is with a sort of world renowned gut health researcher and clinician. And then the other one is, uh, with a clinician who specializes in, in gut health, uh, who's also very smart. And I have a lot of respect for, they have very different opinions on probiotics on a very critical issue. Um, the researcher is very strongly of the opinion that strains matter tremendously. And that even within a given species of, of bacteria, the specific strain determines whether or not you will get an effective outcome. The other uh, gut health expert was, was arguing the opposite, that, you know, kind of all this talk of strains is greatly overblown and, and is largely sort of marketing hype to drive profits by the creators of these strains. What, what's your take on that? I disagree. So I want to, I want to clarify because I think there's a lot of, um, well, I disagree with the second is what I'm going to say. Mm -hmm. And I'll, I'll tell you why, because if you, if you pick up a lot of probiotics on the market, like it might say lactobacillus, acidophilus, bifidobacterium, brevis, it'll have the, the genus and the species name, nothing else. What that tells you is they're using a generic line. Of, of bacteria that has never been tested, has never been studied. We don't know if there's any clinical effect from these. We just know based on extrapolation, but we don't know for sure. When you're looking at a probiotic and it's got the first name, last name, so genus species, and then it's got a code after that name, that's the substrain. Anything with a code the only way it can have that code is because it's a strain that has been clinically studied in a research study, and it's been shown to have some sort of effect. Maybe it's immunomodulates, maybe it stimulates peristalsis, maybe it helps with constipation, uh, maybe it helps lower inflammatory markers. So I think personally, I think it's very important to look at that because, I, and especially, I think this is one of the biggest areas where consumers are completely misinformed mm. because you don't know if you're picking up a, a probiotic by any, I was just showing a patient that who um, had a, was taking a probiotic and I had her, you know, let's look at the label. Let's look at it together. Let's see what's, what's on this label. It just had generic strains. Like, I don't know if any of these strains have been proven to do anything. Mm -hmm. And I think that's, I think it's really important if you care about what you're putting into your body and especially when it comes to probiotic strains and i think eventually probiotics are going to be very specific i mean we we have companies that are studying probiotics that can help with anxiety that can reverse eczema that can help with depression um and that you can't say that every lactobacillus acidophilus is going to do that when it wasn't that strain that wasn't studied mm -hmm. so i think that's really important 
I think the other, the other piece of confusion on probiotics is what the expiration date on the bottle means. And it can mean different things depending on different companies. I think people don't understand this. Like, you know, if you're picking up a bottle of a probiotic and it says 100 billion on it or 30 billion, whatever it is, there's something called, if the company really values what it's doing, there's something called overage. What that means is that when that probiotic is manufactured, and usually at the, at the point of manufacturing, it has two years to expiration, 18 months to 24 months. In order to get to that, they, do, they have to put overage in the capsule. So if it's 100 billion, they might put 130, 150 billion because it's gonna slowly degrade over time and that expiration date doesn't mean the probiotic has expired. It just means that on the date of that expiration, we can still guarantee that there are 100 billion CFUs in one capsule. That's what it means. And I think a lot of people get confused about this because um, they think that expiration dates are the same. They're not the same for everything. And when probiotics, it's really more like guaranteed till date. And depending on the manufacturer, they're really, you know, they're doing third-party testing to see if there are still viable probiotics because there should be, there, there should still be a hundred billion or 30 billion, whatever the bottle is saying, there should be that much or more on the expiration date. Mm -hmm. Got it. Excellent answer. Okay. This will be a challenging one to answer in a few minutes. Um, fiber prebiotics and gut health issues, SIBO, IBS, many people react negatively to certain kinds of fiber. And then they it's extrapolate from this that, um, oh, fiber is bad for me. I need to avoid all these plant foods. They're all bad for me. Uh, we have the rise, of the, the trending of some of these low, extreme low fiber or no fiber carnivore diets and things like that. What's your commentary on that landscape? I'm actually just writing a blog post on this. And where I want to start is we need to expand our definition of what a prebiotic is. Mm. Prebiotic is a nutrient that is used by the microbes in our gut to produce postbiotic nutrients that are beneficial to our well being. Mm -hmm. Now, most people, when you say prebiotic, they're thinking fiber, resistant starch you know, indigestible fiber that's going to stay in the gut. If you have SIBO, that is your freaking enemy because it's going to produce gas, bloating, abdominal pain, can make you, give you diarrhea. It's going to make you feel horrible. Mm -hmm. But the true fact is that there's another type of prebiotic that does not cause that. And it's not a fiber. It's a polyphenol. Mm -hmm. And two of the biggest research ones are pomegranate extract and citrus flavanones. And these polyphenols, what they do, um, they do several things. So one, they are prebiotic, but when they get metabolized, they don't produce gas like fiber does. So for those SIBO patients, you can give them a polyphenol prebiotic and they're going to do okay with it. They're actually going to thrive with it. And the interesting thing that these polyphenols do is that they also link together. So they interlace. So in a patient with SIBO inevitably has leaky gut. Now the polyphenols come in, they interlink and they help the gut bacteria then recreate the mucin layer on the inside of the gut lining. So they help repair the, the mucin layer, the mucus layer. And by doing that, then they help in repair the integrity of the gut lining. So they're actually helping to reverse leaky gut while not causing excess gas and bloating, all that, all those uncomfortable feelings. So I think it polyphenols are going to be the new hero prebiotic mm -hmm. that nobody is paying attention to. Quercetin is in there. Um, I found a study while back when I was looking at ways to increase acromancia because acromancia is a type of bacteria that feeds on, it's called acromancia mucinophilia. And philia we know from Latin is love. So it loves mucin, it eats the mucin. 
But if, isn't, if there isn't a lot of mucin, then you're gonna lose your acromancia. So I was looking at ways like, how can you increase acromancia? And I found a study that showed that quercetin helps increase acromancia. And that was, that was the first time I realized that, wait a second, you're telling me that a bioflavonoid is actually a prebiotic? So it's an anti antioxidant prebiotic. Now I'm not telling listeners to go out and drink a bunch of wine, <laughs> which is full of, of resveratrol, uh, or you know, which is another polyphenol. Um, but you can you can get these in in supplements, um, you know, these pomegranate extracts, and um, the studies have been compelling um, in how they help actually increase microbial diversity and improve the the gut barrier. So. I managed to answer that in about three and a half minutes. Well done. I, I will mention, you mentioned, I like that you mentioned um, pomegranate extract in particular. Uh, it's one of the ingredients in my mitochondrial formula, Energenesis. Uh, the elagic acid uh, in yes. pomegranate is converted by specific microbes in the gut to urolithin A, which yes. then is one of the most powerful promoters of mitophagy to improve mitochondrial health. So, and also uh, blood sugar balancing and um, it's a really important postbiotic and the elagic acid is a prebiotic. Mm -hmm. exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Wonderful. Okay. So, um, Dr. Pedro, I've really enjoyed this. This was, uh, actually a lot of fun having this conversation with you and, and picking your brain particular as, uh, particularly as all these different gut health controversies are fresh in my brain. It was great to, uh, to get your insight into those issues. And um, where can people follow your work, get in touch with you and, and work with you? Uh, several places. The easiest place to find me is on Instagram at Dr. Pedre. I'm also on Facebook, Dr. Vincent Pedre, or my website, pedremd.com. And um, my, my book website, which is happygutlife.com. So lots of different places to find out about me and resources to improve your gut health. Beautiful. Thank you so much, my friend, for coming on the show. This was a lot of fun. I look forward to future conversations. Thank you for having me. Hey there, this is Ari again. Thank you so much for listening to this episode. I hope you enjoyed it. If you did, if you found it valuable, please share it with your friends, share it with your family, help me get the word out there. Also, if you're on YouTube, make sure to hit the subscribe button and hit that little bell to get notifications every time we release a new video or new episode of the podcast. And if you're listening to this, make sure to subscribe to this podcast on iTunes or on your favorite podcast app. Thanks so much for supporting my work at the Energy Blueprint. I hope you enjoyed this episode. I will see you in the next one.